Great. Okay. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. Um, my topic today is game heritage. This is a new twist on two related topics I've dealt with quite a bit over the years, as Maria said, since the last century, game history and digital heritage. The novelty of the topic, game heritage, for me at least, means that the ideas I'm presenting today are still tentative. Therefore, I look forward to your questions and comments after I finish talking. I'll talk for about 25 to 30 minutes. I hope that will leave a lot of time for conversation afterwards. Okay. Heritage, simply put, is that which we inherit. The understanding of the word heritage that concerns us today is relatively recent. In the second edition of the venerable Oxford English Dictionary, the OED, published in 1989, uh, the closest we get to it of five definitions is, and I'm quoting, that which comes from the circumstances of birth, an inherited lot or portion, the condition or state transmitted from ancestors, end quote. So it's not property or an inheritance in the material state, but a condition, something about us that was passed along to us from our forebears. In 1993, the Oxford English Dictionary added a sixth definition. It's closer to our understanding of cultural heritage today, quoting again, characterized by or pertaining to the preservation or exploitation of local and national features of historical, cultural, or scenic interest, especially as tourist attractions. Whether land or culture, we naturally think of inheritance. I better ask, uh, did the slide advance? They did advance, however, they are not in the full screen mode. Um, yeah, let me do that. Hold on just a second. Uh -huh. Bottom, I guess the bottom right. Yeah, the uh, the where I put the um, where oh, I put perfect. the um, video was blocking the button. Okay. Whether in land or culture, we naturally think of inheritance as given from past to present. That is across time. In the past, as a foreign country, David Lowenthal wrote, I'm quoting again, that the past should be irrevocably lost seems unbearable. We crave its recovery. Is there no way to recapture, re-experience, relive it? Some agency, some mechanism, some faith must let us know, see, sense the past. Lowenthal played an important role in defining heritage work from the 1980s through the early 2000s. And much of his book is concerned with the human desire for contact with the past, ranging across topics like time travel and science fiction, nostalgia, or even how things look old. The through line is the problem of making the past present. Today, I'm going to talk about the practical side of preserving and providing access to heritage, but from the modest perspective of my own work in game history. How have we, or might we, present game heritage in spaces both real and virtual? As a curator, how can I build collections or curate exhibits that set up encounters with game heritage? Such heritage work will be novel and difficult, seductive and scary, deliberative and daunting. As I mentioned earlier, game heritage is a spin-off from my work in game history and digital heritage. Believe it or not, that's me in that one photo there about uh, 15 years ago. The practical turn is that I'm emphasizing game heritage as work, as the preservation and delivery of objects and stories to those who might understand or perhaps come to understand games as part of their cultural heritage. In part, this work involves some solving some tricky preservation problems around printed, electronic, and digital games. But in another part, it involves decisions about how to provide access to historical games and to the history of games through collections, exhibits, and narratives. In the lures of software preservation, which I wrote in 2013, for a conference report of the US Library of Congress called Preserve, Pre, excuse me, called Preserving.exe toward a national strategy for software preservation, I described three lures, which you might think of as pat, pitfalls or traps that seduce anyone working in software preservation. These are number one, the lure of the screen, two, the lure of the authentic experience, and three, 
the lure of the executable. The first, the lure of the screen, deals with what has been called screen essentialism, the notion that surface properties, such as graphics displayed on the screen, audio, text, etc., are the essential properties of software. The third, the lure of the executable, counters the expectation that software preservation is limited to maintaining collections of verified historical software and data. I'm not going to say much more about those two today, but I will return to the second one, the issue of authenticity. I followed up that talk about three years later with It Is What It Is, Not What It Was, which I first presented at a digital heritage conference in Australia and later published in Refractory, a journal of entertainment media. In this essay, I wrote about the vexing problem of enacting a contemporary experience to reenact a historical experience and what that has to do with software preservation. I considered three perspectives on that problem through three personas, the historian, the media archeologist, and the reenactor, represented in turn by Hayden White, Wolfgang Ernst, and Robert Lee Hodge. I'm gonna say more about White and Hodge later. Oops. When I reread these essays to prepare for my talk today, I realized pretty quickly that I'm stuck on the second lure in the Library of Congress paper, the lure of the authentic experience. It provided the backdrop for the second paper, and now I'm wondering about authenticity as an issue for heritage presentation and reception, at least for games. Secondly, I'm shifting away from limiting the problem to software or digital heritage. This shift reflects my growing interest in game history and now game heritage as featuring continuities, linkages, and influences among games in a variety of formats, digital, electronic, and tabletop, as well as contexts, play, training, historical simulation, education, etc. Game heritage, I'm saying, is more than a form of digital heritage. A deeper depth of field in this sense brings a different perspective on the problem. To be sure, we need more historical accounts of the interwoven histories of manual and digital war games, for example, as one kind of game. My point today is merely that when we speak of game heritage, we should not limit ourselves just to digital and online games. Okay, so here's the plan for the rest of this talk. I am going to dive into game heritage through two takes. These takes will illustrate narrative and experience respectively as distinct foundations for developing spaces for presenting game heritage. So narrative and experience are two paths into this problem. My use of the word take for these short vignettes mixes two definitions again from the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. The first, a scene or sequence recorded in a single continuous period of filming and the second, an individual's interpretation or assessment of a person, thing, or situation, a particular way of regarding or understanding something. In other words, my takes will be compactly presented scenes or instances you know, around game heritage. I've chosen these scenes as the basis for a few observations, which we'll then discuss more in detail in Q&A, I hope. So let's start with the first take, which is focused on narrative. Yep, narrative is the more problematic of the two takes with regard to space. And why is that the case? After all, there's a long tradition of space as a vehicle for narrative, from memory palaces to the contemporary museum caption you find in any exhibit as the staple really of any exhibit. I'm sorry, for sorry, every, Henry. Yeah, I, I think we are still seeing the same um, slide. Uh, I think it's because I yeah, it's okay. I'm okay. Up, oh, uh, yeah, okay. That's the slide that was about to come up. So that's fine. I okay. was just uh, between slides. All right, fine. Sorry. Okay, uh, after all, there's a long tradition of space as a vehicle for narrative, as I just said, from memory palaces to the contemporary museum caption. But for every neatly arranged memory palace, there is a chaotic cabinet of curiosities. Space is not inherently linear, at least not in the sense of continuous narrative. That's one issue, but it's hardly a deal breaker as the extensive literature on stories as a foundation for museum exhibitions tells us. Leslie Bedford, then a curator at the Boston Children's Museum, wrote in an article called Storytelling, 
the real work of museums, that the power, and I'm quoting, the power of narrative is no secret in the museum world where various forms of storytelling have long been employed to engage visitors. This storytelling in museums is not limited to wall captions, but it includes tours, audio commentary, visitor contributed reflections, object theater, and many other techniques. In other words, location-based storytelling takes us away from linear textual argument, the comfort zone of historians. Of course, this is an opportunity as much as it is a problem. Nevertheless, narrowing our sights to exhibition narrative as a means for heritage work is probably the approach that is closest to what historians do. Historians enact the past by writing about it. In other words, historians tell stories. I'm not saying anything new there. You just have to look at the word, history, right? History. Indeed, in languages such as German and French, as I'm sure many of you know, the words for history and story are identical. Geschichte, for example, in German. If there's anyone here who's heard me talk about historical narrative, you will not be surprised that my go-to historian on this subject is the aforementioned Hayden White. Now, I don't need to advance the slide because it's there already. Who's writing about the methods of history and historiography have been very influential. White's main point about historians is that history is less about subject matter and source material and more about how historians write. He tells us that historians do not simply arrange events called from sources and put them in the correct chronological order. Such arrangements, White calls annals or chronicles. That's a bad word. The authors of these texts merely compile lists of events. The work of the historian begins with the ordering of these events in a different way. Hayden, writes, uh, Hayden White writes in the content of the form that in historical writing, and I'm quoting, the events must be not only registered within the chronological framework of their original occurrence, so that's the chronicle, but narrated as well. That is to say, revealed as possessing a structure, an order of meaning that they do not possess as mere sequence." End quote. How do historians do this? They make choices that involve the form, effect, and message of their stories. The important takeaway here is that the result of these choices by historians is sense-making through the structure of story elements, the use of literary tropes, and emphasis placed on particular ideas. Following Hayden, the word to use here is plots. White gives us the idea that writing history is a kind of implotment, even taking the idea as far as applying literary forms such as comedy, satire, and epic to talk about the narrative choices historians make. Okay, now to some examples. My first example illustrates a few challenges and opportunities for exhibitions that tell the story of a game. This is the exhibition uh, Football Manager, the beautiful exhibition. Of course, that's a take on uh, football or if you're American soccer as the beautiful game. It was created by the National Video Game Archive, uh, Arcade in Nottingham, England, which has since moved to Sheffield under the auspices of the British Game Institute. The curators were Ian Simons and James Newman, working closely with Sports Interactive, the makers of Football Manager, the football soccer simulation game. Consider the following statement by the head of SI, Sports Interactive, about this exhibit. He says, the exhibition is going to be full of exclusive items from the Sports Interactive archives featuring design documents, research schemes, and creative materials which have never been seen before. Uniquely, the project is going to give a glimpse into how Football Manager itself works. One of the most complex, comprehensive simulations ever to be loved by the public, this exhibition is going to explain how it works, how it's grown, and how that all-important final score is decided. New materials, hundreds of objects, unique new interactives." End quote. The exhibition gave visitors access to a bespoke collection of documents, interview footage, and interactives. These elements work together to tell two stories. First, how the game works, and second, how it was made. In some cases, the curatorial decision was made to let the documents speak for themselves. So here, for example, you see a sequence of screenshots uh, on the right. Whoops, 
We don't need to hear Miles talking. Uh, so here, for example, you see a sequence of screenshots. Uh, they're there to illustrate the development of the football manager game engine over the decade from 2008 to 2018, kind of letting those screenshots uh, speak for themselves with a bit of captioning. Of course, access to documentation will nearly always require some level of collaboration with game developers and the player community. Uh, in this email uh, to me about the exhibit, James Newman testified to the high level of cooperation from Sports Interactive, which by the way, is owned by Sega. Not only did they provide access to their staff, documents, artifacts, and data, but SI's managing director, Miles Jacobson, the guy who was starting to speak there, and others stood for interviews uh, and patiently explained how their game works and was developed. Both SI and the player community, uh, thousands of people really, provided data that was used in interactives and visual elements of the exhibition. Football Manager is a complex, time demanding and really never ending game for many of its players. One book about the game is titled just to give you a flavor for this, it's titled 20 Years of Beautiful Obsession, Football Manager Stole My Life. As Jacobson put it in his foreword to that book, Sports Interactive have spent two decades creating and improving a game that has stolen the lives of millions. On the one hand, uh, I ended the quote there, on the one hand, this is a game that clearly was an important part of the lives of its players, taking their lives away actually, dovetailing with game, sports, and media cultures over a period that spans more than 30 years. This clearly provides an opportunity for telling the stories of the making of a complex game, describing the experience of playing it, and documenting the impact of games on a, com a community of players, kind of explaining this obsession uh, that Football Manager represents. In my conversations with Newman about this exhibit project, he particularly emphasized the challenge of presenting the intricacies of the game, its development, and the unique community of developers, players, scouts, and real football teams, and their supporters that has grown around this game. The interpretive effort was challenging. Not only is the game complicated to understand, both in terms of development and play, but tracing the history and significance of its evolving communities required deep participation by SI and the community itself. The museum couldn't do it alone. As Newman notes, I'm quoting here, the depth and time required to play the game make it something, uh, makes it something of a challenge to exhibit in a gallery context. Meeting this challenge required that the National Video Game Archive conceive and engineer new interpretive tools. Okay, this kind of work is not a deterrent, but rather an additional motivation for involving developers and players. Importantly, this collaborative aspect, this collaboration between the museum, the developer and the players contributed to the sense as Jacobson stated in a video recorded for the exhibit, that's the video that you would have seen had I not cut it off. Uh, Jacobson stated, uh, as Jacobson stated in a video recorded for the exhibit, that taking the story of football manager seriously rewarded the various communities around the game with a sense of recognition and valuation. So it helped them to understand who they are to the extent that that is shaped by being obsessed and having their lives taken away by this game, which I would consider heritage work. Okay. By telling stories about people who play games and how these games affect their lives, exhibits acknowledge cultures around games that make up an important part of game heritage. In this regard, I feel uh, obligated to briefly mention two other exhibits. The first is the Victoria and Albert Museum's 2019 exhibit, Design, Play, Disrupt. It is relevant for us today, particularly because of its focus on issues, which of course will have historical components. To the point, the curatorial statement introducing the exhibit specifically highlighted the question, can a historic event be examined seriously by a video game? Here you see the panel about this question. You get an idea, kind of a brief idea of the mix of curatorial commentary, documents, which you see there uh, on that kind of uh, vitrine below the uh, display, 
uh, documents and interactivity presented in the exhibit space. Other important issues for great games were also in the exhibit, such as the representation of race in video games uh, and gender issues were also addressed. Another example of an exhibit linking the history of games and identity is the Rainbow Arcade at the Schwules Museum in Berlin. This exhibit is devoted to queer gaming history from 1985 to 2018 and has resonated successfully with the gamer and the gamer with a Y community communities in Germany. Okay, so let me move on now to take two. I'll leave the slide there for a bit uh, on experience. So as I've said earlier, authenticity is an important concept for digital preservation. A key feature of any digital archive over the preservation lifecycle of its documents and software objects is auditing and verification, as is the case in any archive. Access also involves authenticity. As any discussion of emulation or virtualization will bring up the question of fidelity to an historical experience of using software. Even the act of collecting software, whether of digital or physical objects or collecting documentation around them involves questions of authenticity. So all well and good. However, I want to address a slightly different kind of authenticity today. Rather than judging authenticity in terms of collecting and archiving as curatorial practice, I would like to ask whether authenticity has a role to play in accessing collections or creating and then visiting an exhibition. What would be an authentic experience of what it was like to develop or play games in the past? I think we need to think a bit here about historical reenactment as one way of getting at this problem. Now, I'm not a historical reenactor, at least not the kind you're thinking of. I've never participated in a live recreation or performance of a historical event. However, since I have been playing historical simulations, a category of board games for most of my life, perhaps you could say that I reenact being a historical military officer by staring at maps and moving units around on them. That's a stretch though. It's not the same thing as wearing period uniforms and living the life. In his 1998 book, Confederates in the Attic, Tony Horwitz described historical reenactment in its relationship to lived heritage. His participant journalist reportage begins at a chance encounter with a group of hardcore Civil War, US Civil War reenactors. Their conversation led, Horowitz, uh, led Horowitz on a year long voyage through the American South. A featured character in Confederates in the Attic is the reenactor named Robert Lee Hodge, a contemporary waiter turned historical Confederate Army officer. You see Hodge there in that photo in front of a staple store. He took Horwitz under his wing and provided basic training in reenactment. Hodge even became a minor celebrity for a while due to his role in this book. Hodge taught Horowitz the difference between hardcore and what is called farb or farby, that is more casual reenactment. He tells Horowitz farby is a, a negative thing to say to somebody who's really not that hardcore. He tells Horowitz about dieting to look sufficiently gaunt and malnourished as a Confederate soldier probably would have. The basics of bloating that is resembling a corpse on the battlefield, what to wear, what not to wear, what to eat, what not to eat and so on. It's remarkable how little time he spends on martial basics. It's almost, you know, is not much on fighting. One moment sticks out for me. During the night after a hard day of campaigning, Horowitz finds himself in the authentic situation, we think of, you know, the 1860s of being wet, cold, and hungry. He lacks a blanket. So he's given basic instruction in the sleeping technique of the Confederate infantryman, spooning, so that's what Horowitz does, not as an act of performance, but in order to re-experience the reality, the lived life of Civil War infantrymen. In fact, you know, they spent a lot more time sleeping and eating than they did fighting. Horowitz described the commitment of reenactors to the authenticity of their carefully constructed experience of history, and I'm quoting. 
They sought absolute fidelity to the 1860s. It's homespun clothing, antique speech patterns, sparse diet, and simple utensils. Adhered to properly, this fundamentalism produced a time travel high, or what hardcores called a period rush. Greater numbers of participants are needed for reenacting a battle than sleep. And most of us, if we think of reenactment, we think of these battle reenactments. So when they have these battle reenactments, more of the less dedicated reenactors show up, the Farbies, and thus the general level of engagement actually declines. During staged battles, spectators standing around watching, scripting, general confusion and accidents all interfere with the experience. Immersion breaks whenever dead soldiers pop up on the command, resurrect. In other words, performance takes primacy away from the effort to re-experience. It is likely that many farbs dressed up for battle are content afterwards to find a hotel to sleep in. Ooh, that's bad. Okay, Stephen Gaps, an Australian curator, historian, and reenactor, has spoken of the extraordinary lengths reenactors go to acquire and animate the look and feel of history. Hardcore is not about marching, shooting, and short sword play. So I wonder what a period rush might be for the experience of playing Pitfall or playing the board game Panzer Blitz in the mid 21st century. Shag rugs, ambient new wave radio perhaps, some caffeine free cola. Will future reenactors of historical software seek this level of, of experiential fidelity? I'm quoting Gaps again. Although reenactors invoke the standard of authenticity, they also understand that it is elusive, worth striving for, but never really attainable. So reenactment offers a take on board digital heritage that proposes a commitment to lived experience. I believe that I first encountered a museum space inspired by this commitment in Berlin at the Computerspiele Museum curated by Andreas Lange. But the best example I have is exactly where I would be today to give this lecture if not for COVID-19, the Finnish Museum of Games in Tampere, Finland. I'm not referring to the ex exhibition space, which exhibits, no pun intended, well, actually it was intended, but anyway, which exhibits narrative qualities like those mentioned earlier with a specific focus on Finnish game development. That's not what I mean. Rather, I mean the design of six period rooms, each a space that game players might well have inhabited in 1980, 1985, 1990, 1995, 2001 and 2009 respectively. Five are home spaces, and one is a game store circa 2001. Here in the uh, slide, I hope this is the slide you're seeing of the Finnish Game Museum. Uh, you see a photograph of, the air, of this area of the museum, those are two of the rooms, taken by the game scholar Franz Meira. Some of you probably know him. And here's a closer look at the room you just saw on the left, which depicts a living room in 1980 with a Pong console. It's accompanied on the museum's website by the caption, Father Christmas brought us a brand new Pong. The hum of the CRT television sets the background for a joyous tennis championship match in the living room. And of course, we're in the living room. This caption adds a we are there flavor, noting the presence of a sound, the hum of a CRT, no longer associated with contemporary television. So you're hearing that sound means you're there. This caption adds, uh, just which I just said, the experience encourages the feeling of being there by assembling an array of period authentic objects, consoles, and games. So I'm guessing all of the stuff that you see there is there for a reason. This is closer to a period rush than playing an emulated game originally published in 1980 in a contemporary environment, much as the authenticity of buttons on a uniform is more of the payoff for the hardcore reenactor than the staged battle. I hope you can see that uh, comparison. There's much to discuss about the value of the period rush and the criterion of authenticity that reenactors sometimes fanatically apply to their preferred methods for experiencing history. But let's save that discussion for Q&A. Instead, allow me now to quickly suggest three extensions of the period room concept that you have there in Finland to other ways of experiencing historical game spaces. 
The first is the extension of the game room concept to game objects. If we were live, I would be asking you to raise your hands if you know what that object is that I'm, sh that, that I'm showing you there. Well, that's the humble game counter. Uh, it's actually from the game, if some of you play it, called Advanced Squad Leader. For wargamers since the 1960s, playing a conflict simulation began with its physical construction. The components usually include a map, cardboard counters, printed tables, and of course, a rules manual. After unfolding the map carefully, those who choose to play the game then punched, meaning cut away, counters from the cardboard sheets, which are called sprues. These counters were typically half inch square playing pieces of cardboard and ink, like the two that you see in the slide. Most counters were called unit counters because they represented historical or hypothetical military units or perhaps individual leaders or politicians. A few others were merely markers that helped players keep track of the game state. Anyway, interpreting the information on a typical counter, you see all those numbers, different colors and so forth on those counters. Just remember, there's just a little half inch counter. Interpreting that information depends heavily on conventions of representation that are virtually undecipherable to anyone but a war gamer. As complicated as the grid of information on this tiny cardboard square might appear to be, by the 1970s, as I said, it was conventional. Players immediately incorporated their quick reading of game counters into heated discussions of a game system's accuracy as a simulation. You know, you might dispute one of the numbers that you see on that counter. It is through the understanding of such conventions that game counters link simulation and subculture. And in that respect, uh, some exhibition or some treatment of them would contribute to game heritage. Okay, second, virtual spaces. Virtual worlds are artifacts too. If you know where to look, you can search inside these synthetic worlds as Edward Castronova has called them, investigate the software that constructs these worlds and even find traces of their makers abandoned plans and future projects as you see there on the right. Um, access to the process of creating such a world is related or investigating such a world is related perhaps to the digging of an archeologist or the spelunking of a cave crawler. Uh, and there was much of this in World of Warcraft, the game that you, you see depicted here. It's a process of exploring hidden spaces that reveal their earlier incomplete or abandoned states, including areas that are not meant to be seen because they are still under construction. And it involves much detailed knowledge of how the game is put together, uh, how it's developed. How might we curate the incomplete spaces and models created by human programmers deploying knowledge similar to that involved in the activities I just described? How can we use uh, that to curate the spaces created by programmers, designers, and artists, as well as the work of their explorers? And I mention this because it also offers an alternative to building exhibits to house games. Instead, we might build spaces in games to house exhibits. Third example, heritage work is not restricted to cultural repositories such as museums, libraries, and archives. It's not just about collections, nor to the exhibition of objects that have been collected within the walls of these institutions. There's a lot of work in the field. It also includes the identification, description, cataloging, and conservation of original historical buildings, monuments, archeological sites, and more in situ. For example, Baby Castles in New York. Baby Castles is a venue built to serve a program that con connects two communities, game developers and artists. Documenting such a site would provide opportunities for working with these communities to open up conversations about areas of game heritage, such as game art and game related activism. Sites calling for old fashioned heritage work and conservation might include important esports venues or buildings that have a special place in game history. Two examples that exist now are Ralph Bear's workbench, which has been preserved at the National Museum of American History, and the exploration of Gary Gygax's childhood home in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin by the Dungeons and Dragons historian, John Peterson, which he documented in a YouTube video. Okay, um, it's time for me to wrap up.
uh, and then we'll go to Q&A. History and heritage work are distinct enterprises. Researching and writing histories of games is not the only way to get at game history. When we open game history to heritage work, we bring in new audiences whose attention is driven less by scholarly arguments than by questions about their own identities as developers, players, critics, or whatever the case might be. Cultural institutions not only preserve the documentation that game historians rely on, they can also contribute directly to game heritage work through conservation, curation, exhibition, outreach, and other activities. Historians will probably never be primarily concerned with giving us experiences that connect us to the past or allow us to relive it. The historian's allegiance is to narrative, to conveying the past through narrative and argument, not with reenacting an experience. Is that a problem? Uh, not really, I don't think so. There's value both in telling us about the past and also in trying to imagine what it was like to be there. There are just two different ways to connect the past and the present. Thank you. <laughs>